starting a little bit late. We actually expect a few more people probably coming in, so don't mind if people are just walking in. Um, so thank you for coming. The idea of Startup Jungle for, is, to, um, is to spread the love. We have a lot of people in, uh, in uh, Phnom Penh specifically that are doing some really awesome things, but not everyone knows about it. Uh, we also think there's a big opportunity for, um, to learn from each other, specifically when it comes to building great products. Um, and, whoop, let me see. Yay! So specifically when it comes to building great products and bring them to the markets. That means building products and growing your business. These are sort of the major two topics that we're addressing. The first one we did was on uh, building artificial intelligence applications. That was on the 6th of December. We had a packed room with about 120 people coming. This one will be about uh, user experience and design thinking. I will, in a, in a short while, I'll introduce Elliot and he will tell you all about it in the session. I just want to sort of tell a bit more about, about Startup Jungle first. We'll have other topics coming as well. Uh, we actually are actively recruiting speakers, people that are um, experts in a certain topic, uh, be it uh, blockchain, be it um, you know, Python, be it chatbots, uh, be it whatever it is that you're working on is exciting. Contact us and we'll see whether we can figure something out. We are looking for people with a certain level of expertise um, so that, we can, that the community can learn from them. Um, so if, and we're also preferably looking for uh, people that can also present in English. Uh, we are conscious about the fact that some people just also want Khmer. That's fine. We can probably figure something out. Um, but we're hoping to make it as inclusive as possible as well for, uh, for the entire community. Um, so you can actually see more on the website. Uh, we're looking more or less at one session every month, maybe more. We actually have already several people I want to present. So we might move towards a, even more than once, uh, once a month. Um, the idea is that it's free, so that it's, there's no hindrance for you to come. It's not about the money, it's about learning. Um, and like I said, we're, we're hiring mentors and speakers. Uh, basically what that means is uh, people that have interesting content to share, that the community can benefit from for about two hours, give or take. That they also don't mind being photographed and videographed, as you can tell. Um, we're trying to be able to capture this because not everyone can make it tonight. We will share that information on YouTube um, and uh, we're also looking for potential sponsors. We have uh, tonight, uh, the organization, the videos and, uh, are sponsored by Slash, my company. Uh, the space is sponsored by Emerald Hub, thank you so much for that. And the catering is sponsored by DMI, thank you so much for that as well. So we have uh, different people chipping in to make, this, uh, to make this possible. We have the next one coming up um, on the 7th of March. It will be a business topic. It will be about how to get your first 100 customers. It will be quite, um, we'll talk about a lot of concepts there, especially for people who are aware of things like Lean Startup, uh, MVPs, those type of things. We're primarily focused on people that are looking at building a product and wanting to bring their product to the markets, not just services, uh, although services welcome. Uh, so we'll cover a lot of uh, interesting concepts. Um, I think especially for engineers, it's like a, like a mini MBA, so it might be useful for you to attend if you're an engineer and want to learn more about business. It will give you frameworks to think about business in a very compact manner, yeah? Um, and there will be more announced, so just register on the community uh, and you will get an infrequent message, yeah? We're not looking at spamming uh, probably once a month, twice a month, depending on how many activities we're ramping up, okay? So that's the short intro, and with that, I would love to welcome Elliot on stage from DMI, and he will tell you everything about UX. Thank you. All right, yeah, thanks, uh, Andres, for the introduction. So tonight, we're going to talk about something like uh, user experience design, uh, user-centric design, and also something like um, Design thinking. Uh, but to begin with, uh, maybe it's better that I tell you something about myself, who is this guy here talking. Uh, I was born and raised in Hong Kong, and then uh, I lived there for my young time, and then uh, I moved to a country called Finland. Uh, this is some house that looks exactly like my neighbors. I lived there like 25 years, and then two years ago I moved here to Cambodia. 
And uh, for many years, I was in Finland uh, working uh, on and off in different Nokia projects. Uh, for those of you old enough, you probably remember phones like this and games like this, right? So we were doing a lot of campaigns and different design on, on devices like this, you know. There was a system called Symbian. And uh, my last position in Finland, uh, I was working in a rather big publishing company in uh, the Nordic countries that uh, I was leading the design team in the digital services. So these are some of the magazines we published. And uh, here in Cambodia, I work at DMI, uh, a mobile solution provider. I lead the CX design team over here. Uh, apart from work, I play a lot of games. Uh, who can tell me what game this is? Nobody knows? Yes! Oh, wow! Who oh, you play ever? <laughs> yeah, Law of the Rings Online. This is Mia, a very high level, you know, uh, Elephant Hunter, Pew Pew, and then I, I get a lot of top gears, you know. And this is also Mia playing uh, when I was a little kid, uh, very, very young, on my paternity leave, you know, I was playing most of the time. So, uh, anybody here like to play games? Anybody here developing games? What about uh, different services, apps? All right, good, good. Some people are here doing so. <clears throat> tonight, we're going to talk about uh, this user experience design. And uh, don't worry, I get uh, 113 slides to go through and then uh, we will have a break in between. There will be drinks and a pizza outside and then we continue. Uh, the plan is to have a, a basic introduction to user experience design or usually we call it UX this evening and then we'll have a part two later on to have a hands-on workshop to practice some of the methods or skills that I will tell you about here tonight. So uh, this is part one. Uh, if we talk about design, my experience here is that uh, a lot of times people understand design as uh, colors, you make something look nice and bling bling. A lot of times in my company, people want to have uh, nice uh, graphics. They come to me and say, Elliot, you know, uh, your team is designers. Can you make us something? Can you just make this presentation look good? Or some, something about, you know, typography, fonts and all design of uh, any other graphics and like icons. In terms of UX and also in DMI, what we understand in my team as UX is that uh, we want to develop some surveys. We want to design some surveys that is so good that will bring us a lot of money. This is usually how we try to see that, right? Some of my designers, I don't know, they're shaking their heads, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, but, you know, for those of you who is new to UX or has been practicing a little bit, uh, you might wonder, I mean, is this something really new? Something like a really like, wow, it will bring you a lot of money as such? What on earth is that? Uh, the matter of design or user experience design is actually nothing new. You can see that almost every day, everywhere a lot of times you also question yourself. So for instance, you know, uh, I don't like to drive, but I do have some opinion about car design somehow, you know. I, 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 anybody have seen this car before? It's a Fiat, you know. I, I have been always wondering, that this, is, must be, this must be the worst car I have ever seen, you know, one of them. I, I never understand what, what this light is all. Look, this is normal headlights, right? I mean, why, why do you have extra things over there? I don't understand. And the other thing is that, yeah, you know, designing certain kind of space or your usage, you know, look at that, you know, people are saying that uh, it's good to have chairs for people waiting for the bus, but then they don't think about, you know, what about when it rains, then uh, it, it doesn't really seem to help. There's a lot of times also you see some, some images in, 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 uh, in the web online that you see things like uh, people build something and then they think, okay, this is how I think that it should be. And then that's why people will use it, such a toilet like this. I, I, I don't know, man. 
and then and the, and the fact is that it takes a long time also a lot of times like the cars or building the benches or putting uh, a toilet like this you know it takes effort and time it's not just like you know I wake up one morning I think oh I, I want to make a chair and then I, I spend you know, a few hours and make it happen so there's a lot of waste of time and energy uh, there's one really good example I, 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 I want to bring up here because of my work before my past life anybody remember I have seen these phones yeah wow I'm, I'm surprised <laughs> this is engage you know, the first try ever, any mobile device manufacturer tried to bring games, mobile games, to their platform. The games are not bad, but there was some, some other fault, but we are not talking about here. Um, that thing came out about, what, 2002, 2003, and the same thing for that phone. Maybe many of you don't know or haven't seen this before. It's a Nokia 7700. It was a phone announced, but it never went to the market. They just killed it. I have a couple of them still at my home in Finland. I get a big box of all the prototypes and funny phones. And these phones I remember really well because uh, that started some kind of culture called side talking. You know, have you ever tried anything like this before? Yeah, you have? Side talking, what it means is that, you know, literally, the microphone, as you can see here in details, it is here, you, you talk like this. This is side talking. It talks like this. Look, that's what he was, he's doing now. The, the phone, uh, no, no, the speaker and the microphone is here. You talk like this. So on the street in Helsinki, for example, I, I really try a lot of times. Like 500 meters away on the street, I can see that that guy is using a Nokia phone. <laughs> uh, they only make two phones like this uh, for a particular reason. I think uh, people didn't particularly like it. But then one thing that really got my mind was that, uh, look, look here. This is a charging port. Um, if you ever try to charge and talk at the same time, then you'll be, you'll be chilling your, your cable, charging cable a lot of time. That, that was uh, something rather funny. I think the designer didn't think about that. This kind of situation in real life, in park, I think you pretty much you see that quite often, right? <laughs> and the other thing that I, I mean, it, it takes uh, quite a while to build this kind of path. It's not just like one or two days work. So it's again, building of a uh, you know, waste of time and energy and frustrations. And people walk around and say, oh, come on, why, why, <laughs> what's going on? Why don't people walk here? Why do they walk here? The other thing I, I notice a lot of times, or many of you probably do also, is that uh, when you have a client, you go to them and then say, hey, we suggest that you should have this and this and this kind of uh, design or, 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 or product. And then they will come back to you and say, no, 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 listen, Elliot, I have been in this business for 20 years. I know what I'm talking about. I know all my customers. Just do what I tell you, right? This is a lot of times based on assumptions. Assumptions a lot of times may be good. It might cut off some of time. It save a lot of energy, but sometimes it will also bring you to a situation like this. That uh, the, the blogger thinks that okay, well, I get a, a lot of people. Now look at analytics. Uh, well, I have one people, and the, on the other hand, you know, you have a design school saying that hey, no, let, let's go and check it out. <laughs> it's based on assumptions. Uh, Quite a few years back, uh, about was it eight years or ten years ago, I, 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 I read about a case of an uh, airport in uh, a major airport in Europe. I don't remember which airport it was. Was it Amsterdam or, or somewhere in, in Germany? The management realized there was a particular problem that uh, the, it seemed like they didn't have enough toilets. There was always queues outside in the airport. So they, uh, the management just thought that, okay, you know, we don't have enough airport, uh, toilets, there are a lot of people queuing up, we should build more toilets, right? And then some people uh, in the team were smart enough with uh, design thinking, I, I suppose, said, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. manager, let, let's go to check it out, what, what is the real problem, right? While they're queuing up for the toilet. You know what they found out? They found out was that uh, there was a lot of people queuing up going to the toilet, yes. 
But at the same time, there were, there were a lot of people inside the toilet. They didn't want to come out. <laughs> and these people, they were, most of them, they were elderly people. And they were trying to wonder, why on earth do you stay there so long? And they were not doing particular things that you are supposed to do in the toilet. They were staying inside. And that's why there was a lot of people queuing up, waiting for the space. They were inside, they found out, because in, in the toilets, they were quieter. That they could hear the announcement easier. <laughs> and think about that. If the management didn't listen to the staff and try to find out what was the real problem, instead they said, ah, let's build no 10 more toilets. It wouldn't solve the problem. So after that, they tried to make some, let's say, uh, these days, you see a lot of times in many airports, they have some quiet areas that you want to hear announcement or you want to just keep your peace, you go there. It's much cheaper to build new toilets, I suppose, right? There's a thing that uh, uh, I don't remember where I got this quote from, but then, uh, you know, many of these uh, examples I just show you, this captures that very nicely. It's not the technologies or the devices or whatever resources that we're lacking. It's a lot of times it's more like, the, we, what, what do we know about people? It's not that I build it and the people will use it, right? A lot of times you build something, people don't use it. And uh, one problem is that um, for those of you who are in the IT or software business, this is the average statistics. When you build an app, when you build a website, a lot of times in the development time, half of that can be avoided. You know, if you're in the business, think about the numbers, how much money is, how much time is wasted. The other thing also is that uh, in terms of uh, uh, change, when you build a website, when you build an app, you need to actually change something. The cause of that change, when the app is live, in the development phase, compared to when the app is still in the concept or design phase, the cost can be very dramatic difference. And if I put it the other way, you know, the cost to fix a problem, to fix an error, when you before or during development or after can be as high as 100 times. It's purely about money. Suppose you develop a service, you have an app or website, you push out to the market these days. Wow. How can you stand the competition? How can the consumers or the users you know, fix? Uh, there's one interesting thing uh, uh, we noticed. How many phones do you all have each? I actually, I have three. Maybe you have one, and sometimes two, or somehow. But I have only one toothbrush at home. These days, uh, if you're in the app business, which like we are, we know that you know it is very, very hard to stand in front, ahead in the competition. You know how hard and how much money you need to put in to get to the top charts. There's so many, many apps out there. Whatever you ever think of, you want to develop. It, it's just mind blowing. <clears throat> Suppose you get in the competition, you stay ahead, people download your app. There's this uh, rather depressing fact. <laughs> Every four, uh, <laughs> one in four person use the app once and they just delete it. <clears throat> and also, uh, on the other hand, about 16% of the people in studies, they say they will keep the app more if the experience is more pleasurable, more pleasant. So, suppose you get the user to start using the app that you, which, which you developed, and then, then they develop habits. But uh, it doesn't really pay off to try to hurt the user, right? Because there's a study, for example, uh, uh, some years back, on average, uh, a mobile phone user each day, they will unlock the phone 150 times which means that in average, every 5.6 minutes, an average person will open, unlock the phone. Every time they do that, it's a touch point. So suppose your app in the morning, they open, ouch, there's something, it just doesn't work. 
and then they open it again in the app in the uh, five o'clock in the evening. Ouch! Another time. It, you think of it yourself. You know, if the, it comes more and more, then every time is an ouch. How many times do you think the users will take before they will delete your app? So. All this example trying to show you is that you know if you get the user experience uh, not right, if the design is not right, then there's a lot of problems, and they are based on some kind of assumptions. Uh, they will give you risk, they will give you extra costs, you will lose customers, and you are just like all the others in the market that nobody notices you. That's when. UX come into place what we def what we de uh, 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 understand and we believe in that user experience design could solve at least some of these problems because we believe that you know in design in our work we want to focus on the users first we don't want to focus on assumptions we don't want to focus on whatever we feel is a uh, very dear our darling there's a, there's a, this face that you know kill your darling when we design something. We want to understand the users, who is your target audience, who is she or he, what kind of needs they have, or she has or he has, what kind of problems they need to solve, or then what kind of delights they would get or they want to get. So designers in the UX or survey design or, or user-centric design in general, they ask a lot of questions. Why? What's this? Why is it happening? Who is these people? What are they doing? What do they need? So, for instance, we're, we're, when you see somebody you know, is walking on a, on a stake, you know, with a broken leg, you ask, what happened? Why? Who's this person? Oh, we found out that he actually fell down you know, the other day, and now the, the, that's why it's broken, and he fell down on something. What was that? It was some kind of shit. Oh, what kind of shit was that? So, so we need to find out all the things and try to understand this user to try to solve that problem. So, if, uh, for a more academic uh, definition, user experience design, UX, is a discipline that we want to make a better product. More usable, more accessible, more pressurable, making the users more satisfied. This is what we do, our discipline. User-centric design is actually a process how we do and practice UX. Surface design can also use this. Uh, product design can also use this. Car manufacturing, they also can use this. And when you talk about design thinking, it's just a method to solve complex problems. It's a mentality. So for example, instead of uh, uh, trying to find very definite answers, with the design thinking, you are comfortable with uh, vague ideas, ambiguities. You keep many options open. You always ask, what if? You don't look for actual results, you look for uh, meanings. You ask why and what all the time. A product or service is always you can, you can improve on. There's no right and wrong answer, there's no end date. You can, it's continuous. This is design thinking. And uh, one very much uh, some kind of law that we keep very much um, in our head as designers is that uh, when you design on a service, when you design an app, we keep on telling ourselves that uh, we, you, we are not a user. Go to find who are the actual users, understand the problem, validate, improve, design for them. Exactly, here, we want to focus here. We want to find out actually that, we want to find paths like this, before we build something like this. Instead of building something like this and say, oh, people will use it. They don't. So for money, for example, what we want to do a lot of times in our business, we want to know our users better, and then, then, then we can solve their problems better then we can give them better experience and eventually they will be happier. When they're happier, then we actually have less risk in business and higher potential to make more money. In a way, we want to create services that people love to use. 
Love is a big word here. It's not that easy because uh, when you think about creating a service, creating a product, an app, you know, love is actually somewhere up here. But before you can get here, you have to actually make the right functions. Should that be a purchasing, you know, a, a function, checkout, social media integrations? Should that be a chat function? And then when you figure out all that you have all this, and then you have to make it reliable, and then you have to increase your usability. Instead of nine clicks, you have to reduce it to three clicks, for example. And only then you can talk about love. There's a lot of work here. So when you talk about, okay, why do you spend all this time? Why do you ask all these questions? Why UX? Just because, remember all the examples I showed you earlier? If you practice UX well, you can kill assumption, you can avoid all the risks, save costs, get a lot of customers, stay ahead in the competition so that you can make service and make a lot of money. Among other things. Right? So you say, okay, would you believe in this? How do we do it? How do we practice UX? Uh, we have, uh, well, the practicing UX basically, like uh, what I'm trying to say to you is that how we can understand the users like you know, there's a mess here in the, in, the, in the researcher, in the designer's head and try to get the thing out from the user. How do we do that? There are many tools and methodologies. Uh, at DMI, we have some structure. For example, in UX, we have a user research, user researcher, uh, UI designer, visual designers who try to you know, make the part of UX. We also have a division, for example, for customer success using big data, service design, and many other tools that, you know, that, that we see when is you know, appropriate, and then we will just deploy and then practice and try to make the best out of it. <clears throat> Some of these I, I will actually go through in my, in my talk later on. And, uh, we do have uh, quite some process in the design. <clears throat> so for example, you know, we want to understand the problems better, talk to the people, go to the physical locations, maybe have surveys, and then as it goes, the more data we get, the more actually abstract it becomes. At some point, we actually understand some of uh, the user, the customer journey, the whole trip, and then we start making ideas and then based on problems, and we come back down to some definite plan, we get back to more concrete levels. This is one way to see it in, a, in, a, in our process. And then uh, we have another process also, you know, that <clears throat> to try to simplify that a bit more, that uh, we try to understand users first, and then we try to understand what's a real problem. And then we find ideas and concepts to validate, and then we arrive at a validated concept, and only then we start developing it. This is another way to see the UX design process. But you can actually simplify this more. You know how? This is our design process. Also, that in the beginning, there's a mess. I don't understand what is going on. I don't want to assume. I just want to go to find out, ask questions, get data in, understand what's the problem. And then once we have a better idea what is the situation, what is the case that is worth, what is the problem is it worth solving, and then we start concepting and getting validations. And only when we got things clear and validated, then we could have developed. And after what we could have learned better. With this or other process and methods, it will enable us to answer, to fill in the blanks here. If you're developing certain surveys or apps, then with your business idea or concept, you should be able to answer, uh, fill in the blanks here, right? What is your service helping what audience who need to or want to do what by giving them what benefits? Right? So to begin with, we need to understand the problems, which is here, and also the audience. Who is this? What is the problem? <clears throat> we want to understand if there's a problem to be solved. How do we do that? Uh, one method a lot of times we just simply do is that we go out to the street and observe and look. We have had a project in Europe uh, to work with uh, a train manufacturer. They make big trains. 
they want to digitalize the customer service, the user service experience. So what we did, part of the, the design process, we went to the trains to observe how do the, the, the passengers, the commuters, how do they experience the train rides? Inside, outside, before, after, and then we gather the data in, the observations. We will also talk with the uh, business stakeholders. What is the view they have in this business? The needs, the fear, uh, the targets, or also problems they see. We also go to interview the potential users. We want to listen from the story from both sides. Uh, a lot of times we also, if we get the data, we would uh, <coughs> Uh, get the comments or feedbacks in the customer service. This is some, some of the examples that we, we get uh, in one project. <coughs> some customers actually, they, they, these are actual comments. So from this, we can actually get an idea if the problem right now or your service right now having some problem of uh, verification, is a password problem entering? <coughs> or is it something with the login problems? Or is it onboarding in the app or is it the too many clicks too many functions they don't understand what's going on so once we get all these different information back then we try to make sense of them we put them around in a, a decode that's what we call data decoding and synthesize we try to put them in a more understandable digestible format a lot of times you actually work together with a client, uh, not just the business side, but also maybe on the marketing side, on the technology side, or also designers potentially, and try to have a wider perspective. When we try to have workshop together to try to understand these problems, <clears throat> try to group them together. And uh, a lot of times we also try to work out uh, personas some people, they are really like, uh, they buy a lot. Some people, they are very conscious about prices. Some people, they never buy more than uh, three times or four times in the whole life cycle. We can actually get those stories out of the personas. Who are this audience? And with the data, with the personas, we can also come up with a journey map. We try to get a typical kind of uh, customer journey from the first touch point to your service to the last. So this is one exercise. For example, uh, some of our designers you know, try to put the data together and so we can visualize <coughs> a journey map. Uh, it can be a simple journey map that uh, you just simply mark the time that you know, in the morning what happens and then uh, what time they will actually come back home again or then what time they will use the service and where. It can be also a, a little bit more elaborated that uh, you put into, for example, actual customer comments or complaints into a particular stage that uh, when you buy a plan or before making appointments in a health service the tool is supposed to help you to uh, have a more visual and comprehensive understanding of the user's journey, experience, the pains and the delights. <clears throat> Once we have actually all, all, all this in place then uh, the next thing we want to do is that we want to understand what is the real problem here. Is it uh, people don't have any trust in the service? Or is it a real technical problem? Or is it just that the value proposition of the service of the app simply doesn't match the needs of the customers or users? This exercise, a lot of times we, we gather uh, a wide range of uh, stakeholders from the uh, client side and also from our design team together we try to get again a wide perspective to understand what is a problem that's worthwhile to solve to fill in this blank so that we can go to find the right solutions to attack that problem okay this actually marks the, 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 uh, the end of the first phase, what we usually call discovery or understand in the UX 
process, design process. So now I actually have a test for you guys before we go out to try to eat some uh, pizza and uh, soft drinks. Um, the other day, actually, a lot of times we, 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 I, I noticed one little interesting problem. Our office, DMI, is in the, uh, just right by the uh, night market, Pisari Um We have about 100 people in our office. Outside Pisari Udre, there are many buses. There's a bus stop. You must have seen some of these buses running around, right? Uh, Sometime last year, for example, China actually donated a hundred buses to Phnom Penh. These are new buses. What I found out was uh, kind of interesting that uh, none of our employees in our office at DMI, 100 of them, none of them take these buses. Zero. Even though the, all the buses are there. And these buses, most of the time, what I notice is that uh, they run around in, in the city almost like half empty. Uh, I would imagine the main purpose of uh, public transportation is to help to uh, make the transportation easier and also less pollution, less traffic, right? So, the question is that, hey, um, what is going on? What is the problem here? People, they don't take buses, even though there are many of them. They're not that bad, they have aircon and it's cheap. They run a particular route, it's uh, unlike Tok Tok, you know, they, they take you around sometimes and they, they, sometimes they also take you for a ride that you don't want. So what I would like you to do is that, you know, you, you talk with other people, maybe a three or four together during the break and try to understand or, or talk about, you know, why, why, why do people here, they don't take buses? What is the real problem? Okay? Grab the people around you, every one of you actually have a name tag. This, like Andres said in the beginning, uh, this uh, event is also, uh, we would like to use this event as a networking opportunity. Okay, then we come back after the break. Hey, someone give me some answers or ideas. Too long time. The the schedule is not good. Traffic. And that's uh, the only problems. Any other? Three buses, so the planning of the routes are not right. <laughs> Anything else? I have heard from my uh, local staff that uh, the bus ticket is really cheap, with uh, 1,500 riyals. So that shouldn't be a problem. And also inside they have aircon, so that shouldn't be a problem either. So maybe uh, we could also think about that if we want to somehow solve that problem. <clears throat> Because if you can get the proper transportation working fine, I would imagine that you can solve some of the traffic problem here. So that was just one, one example. I was trying to um, <coughs> show that, you know, how the uh, design thinking and also the user experience design, how we would try to solve particular problems or come up with new service or improvement. So now what we left uh, before the break was that uh, Suppose we know now there's a particular problem that's worth solving. For example, we want to find out a way to increase the usage of buses in Phnom Penh. The problem is that the, the, the routing is a problem, the schedule is a problem. So how to find a solution for that? Instead of relying on our assumptions, we want to do another way to find a solution. This way is uh, what a lot of times uh, big bosses or also a lot of us, you know, really rely on. Oh, there's this problem. I know the solution. Let's fix it. Yes, I know. 
But with the design thinking and what we do a lot of times in the uh, user experience design, we want to find out all the possibilities. We want to explore the opportunities. We want to come up with many ideas and validate and test them. Why? Because that will increase our chance to get to somewhere that is a really the most optimal. Maybe not the best solution, but much better solution. If you're, always, if you're aiming at one, you're actually focusing your, uh, your energy, your attention to something like a tunnel. But if you explore many things, you test, oh no, it's not right, you test another one and test, and then eventually you arrive at something much better. It increase your chance to get there, it increase your knowledge, understanding of the users again. <clears throat> so, if we know the problem, the logical question to ask is that, you know, how might we solve that problem? And there's a one method that we use a lot of times in our design, which is called, how might we? So what we do practically is that we gather uh, stakeholders again from uh, different departments, from different teams, from the client side, from our team also, technical business or design, or even the, the users. We come together and then we highlight the main problem, what we want to solve. And then we come up with many ideas. We give, let's say, 10 minutes per person that you write down your, your concept, your ideas, each one on a post-it and put it on top of the table or the wall and then we discuss. Sometimes we also give time for people to uh, elaborate, explain more their concept, their ideas to the group of the people. A lot of times, the more you speak out, the more you verbalize your ideas, the better it helps you to think and reason. And uh, sometimes we also <clears throat> have people to draw out some kind of scenarios to explain their concept. This uh, image, unfortunately, is a bit bad, but it was something exactly about buses. Uh, we just get some kind of exercise and workshop in our team uh, some time ago that uh, how to increase the usage of buses here that uh, someone, some of us actually came up with the idea, oh, you, you can play some game, you, know, you can have some kind of uh, royalty points and then uh, you can just gamify it somehow. The more points you get, the more benefits you get, we can get uh, uh, also partners and sponsors somehow. So that was one idea. And then uh, when we get many, many, many ideas, then we try to talk in a group that, you know, we try to rank them, we try to vote on them and see which one of them we think they are more potential. More, more attractive or crazier. For some of these ideas that we would spend more time to work on something what we call wireframe. So for example, if we want to come up with an app for uh, pen on pen buses, how does this app would look like for this particular concept? How many steps, how many buttons, what kind of functions they are? But very quickly, the key here is quick, speed. Don't spend like uh, one week to work on some wireframes. We spend maybe one hour, two hours. Some of this, we can even put it together uh, onto the device. If we believe in it, we test more, then it can become an interactive prototype that some part of it can be clickable that will lead you to another screen. There are a lot of tools like this available. Apps, online, whatever. We use uh, a lot of times InVision, the tool. I mean, some of us, uh, some of you might, might know that really well. And once we have some prototype, whether it's a paper prototype, which uh, we, we, we show here, or interactive prototype, which you can actually show on the device, then we go to talk with users, test, validate, and then we show it to them that, hey, you know, I have this, this, this thing here, you know. Do you understand what this is about? What is your impression? What do you think? Or, hey, uh, I have a test for you. Can you uh, make a booking here? Do you know which button to push first? You observe the tester, the users, the reaction. Also, a lot of times, and maybe where they look at, how many times they push something, what they say. They might say that, ah, oh, why doesn't it work? Oh my God, this is too small. Or then, hey, I, I don't understand. You take in all the observation, all the data in, from test to test, and then we keep on doing that. 
test, we find, sleep, we do again for a week, maybe for 10 days, 10 tests or 20. Then we get all the data in, then what do we do? We refine them, we understand again, we validate our concept. Maybe people actually don't want even points when they get to a bus. So, you know, Elliot, forget about the points, forget about the games, you know. People don't like it when they take buses, it's not the main thing. So when, when, when we have all the validation, we put the ideas, concept or functions into a bigger picture, which what we call the uh, uh, prioritization. Which one is more uh, viable, which one actually we get a lot more positive or negative uh, uh, feedback or validation from the testers. And then we, we map them out. And then we can also a lot of times map them out in a more systematic way that uh, in terms of uh, business or technical feasibility, how low or how high, in terms of business value or user value, how low or how high, then we just put all the functions or ideas onto the map. Then logically, we want to actually have something, these are quick wins because the feasibility Actually, it's very high, it's easy to do, but then there's a lot of business value. That's why it's quick, quick wins. And the other part is that, okay, maybe some of this has a lot of business value, but needs a lot of uh, uh, work to do. Maybe we put it to the development world map, and the others, most of the time, we teach them. So we want to systematically take advantage of the uh, uh, insights that we get from the users the actual validation in the real world. So that once we have something like this, and only then we go to maybe create more elaborated assets like uh, mock-up screens, or uh, something what we call the, 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 the app <coughs> surface structures, how different pages, different actions will lead to where. This comes to a very late stage already after all the validation and testing. And that, brings us again to this uh, more or less the same de design process that we've been talking about in different form. First, we want to understand what is a problem and what problem is worth solving. And only then we go to kind of concept and find solution for it. And once we have a validated concept, only then we go to develop. This is UX in a nutshell. Or if you want to understand it better, oh, this is our design process. Why? If you don't remember what I was talking about an hour ago, there because there are too many slides. We want to find this path before we build this. How? We ask the users. And if we can do this, then it will enable us to kill all the assumptions, save costs, get more money and stay ahead in the competition so that it will enable us to make a lot more money. Okay. So this is the typical design process that we go through with our client or in our daily work in, in UX design. You might ask, hey, this is only very theoretical, a lot of uh, you know, vague and high level ideas or examples, is there any real case that we have done somehow? So let me go through some of that with you. But all of them anyway is about, you know, understand the user, validate your ideas and concepts, use your design thinking. Some time ago we did a case with a Victoria's Secret. I guess you know this brand, right? They sell underwears for women. They don't have men underwears, right? They don't. <clears throat> so we work with them. Uh, uh, then um, they said that, that they would like to increase or improve the uh, shopping experience. They noticed that uh, in the data, a lot of people, they drop out at the checkout screen. So they uh, we work with them and then we try to understand, okay, how, how, how can we get the people not to check, not to drop out because they don't check out, they don't pay, no money. It's so simple. 
So we quite try to <coughs> keep the people away from dropping out. Uh, we work with their data, the analytics, and try to understand the segmentation of the user, the customers. What we found out was that uh, there's a lot of people that drop out there, not because they didn't have money, <laughs> not because they didn't find what they wanted, not because uh, 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 there was any technical problem, but because they saw the shipment rate was too high. Once you see the shipment rate too high, a lot of them actually they just said, you know, I, I don't want to pay anymore. In terms of service, the user experience, there was nothing for them actually to try to solve that particular problem. One easy way as an assumption is that, okay, if the shipment rate is too high, can we just give everyone Free shipment. But they said, no, we cannot do that. Why? Because it's a particular business problem. If you give the, the free shipment to everyone, then there's a margin, in, in a business margin that they cannot sustain. That is not doable. So we actually looked deeper. What we found out was that we actually worked out different personas of the customers for them, by using the, the, uh, uh, the data that we get. Some customers, they don't care about the shipment rate. They say, well, it's okay, I can pay. But there are some actually very sensitive to them. So what we had to do was then to identify, isolate this bunch of people and give them some goodies, maybe uh, this kind of shipment. Or maybe in the checkout page, we say that, hey, if you buy more, then we will give you free shipment to offset that, that, that margin. And that was introduced in the service, in the development, based on this understanding of the personas, based on understanding the problems of the users, some of them they, they, they have. Uh, the recommendation and also the new design enable them to ha have an increase of net sales online to up to 15% increase. Another case that we, we have done before is uh, with uh, Warburton's. Uh, maybe this is not really familiar with you. This is one of the, yeah, some of us, <laughs> yeah, but saying that, yeah. This is one of the biggest bakery in the United Kingdom. Has a market share there of 25%. They bake a lot of bread and bakery product. They have about 4,500 employees all over in the United Kingdom. So uh, they got a particular problem. We found out when we worked with them uh, uh, some years back that uh, for logistics, they, they, they have a particular problem. Imagine 4,500 people. And there's a lot of them actually, they work in the inventory and then in the, in the retail part. They need to actually um, record data. From the shop to shop, from uh, 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 outlet to outlet, also from the uh, uh, bakeries, the actual bakeries. They need to track the inventories, they need to track all kinds of data. So that for example, uh, 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 all the people in the retail team, they had to enter the data one day, one week, each one of them. So what we did with them was that we tried to understand the whole process. What was the problem? Was there something totally unnecessary? or where and how and when they would need to enter certain data and when not. So we were talking and working with the employees and also the actual locations, again using some of these methods that I showed you before. The result was that we managed to reduce that data entry before was one day per week. After that, based on our design, it became one day per month. I don't have the actual numbers, how much money is saved in the overhead, but with a workforce of 4,500 people, you reduce that work amount, maybe you do the mess. Again, it's an understanding about users. Remember, the users are not always just you know, customers, consumers buying your app. It can be also in a company, in a process, in a business. It can be internal. Another case, uh, yeah, some of you who are working with me or in the DMI before, you know that. 
Edison Lee, another really rather big company in the United Kingdom. This practically is uh, one of the biggest uh, taxi company in the UK. Fighting head to head, you know, toe to toe with uh, Uber. So a lot of black cabs that you see in London or in the United Kingdom, they work in this network. Uh, when we first started working with them uh, five, six years ago, they got some problem because they saw, they start seeing a really, really heavy competition coming in, Uber for example. And they only then started to use uh, uh, developing, uh, uh, deploying the app. It was not working. So we start working with them, work on the process, go through the whole customer journey, map out all the problems from stage to stage, before the surveys, during the surveys, after the surveys, map out all the activities. Take taxis ourselves, talk to the customers, talk to the service, talk to the, the, the other stakeholders inside. Get a visualized, more comprehensive picture. Where are the major problems? And also check the app, work with them, make these different kind of prototypes, testing. The end result after the engagement of the design for four months or something. For example, one major improvement was that the ordering process, it was nine clicks. We reduced it, we reduced it down to three clicks. That was one of the improvements. The end result with combination of all this uh, 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 research and, and, and <coughs> design activities was that uh, the conversion rate improved by 26%. Customer satisfaction improved by 50%. Six months after that new design launch. So these days, if you go to UK, you can still see that uh, they are doing fine, even though there are all these different apps. Fighting with them in the taxi and in this uh, <coughs> sharing transportation industry. Uh, if you come back closer and then back to Cambodia, some examples I can show you is that uh, what we have done in Cambodia, for example, uh, with DMI, because uh, what we notice is that a lot of people, they don't know what DMI is, what we do, even though we have 100 people here in, in our Pen on Pen office. Wing, the app, in the beginning, we were working with them, we designed and also we developed for them. With the design process also. Another much closer to the uh, current stage is that uh, with the smart, the apps, we help them, we also design for them. We did uh, research with the users, we did the surveys, we also did ideations, we do our testings. So everything almost by the book according to our belief in the UX design and also in the process. Also Smart Lawyer app. Another one that uh, uh, may be not that well known to you, uh, the audience here is that uh, there is a service provider called Sentify. It's based in Vietnam and also um, Switzerland. Last year we did a, a, a work for them. They uh, <coughs> Sentify aggregate uh, information from the web, the internet, and also social media to provide uh, 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 for the financial investors to make better decisions. So what we did with them was that practically, we again, we talked to a lot of uh, potential users, uh, investors, and also the stakeholders to try to understand what is a real problem in this service because one thing that they wanted us to help them to do was the, to improve the, the application the user experience, to increase the usage. What we found out at the end was that uh, there was uh, the major problem was not that the information was not uh, accurate or good enough, or the app in itself, the user interface was not good enough. The major problem we found out was that uh, there was not enough trust to the information given. The core problem with the user experience was trust. That's when we start trying to attack and tackle that problem. How to improve trust. So uh, <clears throat> this screen, some of them are where some ideas that we will try to put together. But one way, for example, to try to improve trust is 
make a better marketing, uh, better and more straightforward onboarding when you start the app, the service. Uh, another project we've been working on is uh, a chatbot, which a lot of people these days they really talk about, they're really getting crazy, chatbot this, chatbot that, or the AI. We've been working with a major hotel chain uh, in Singapore to develop a chatbot. Uh, making a chatbot itself is not difficult at all. There are many tools these days you can just make it, you know, almost within a day. Anybody can do it. I can even do it as a designer. But there are examples here we realize and also we don't want to do. We don't want to, you know, follow the same track. For example, you can see the, the example here now. These are actual conversations I have had with them. So, for example, Qantas, the airlines, uh, I, I fly quite a lot. I like to collect points, okay? So when you collect mileage points, you want to know which alliance. So I just simply went there, maybe half jokingly, trying to test the bot. I just asked this question. And they came back to me. You need customer support? I repeat my question again. And he gave me the same answer. Then I drop out. Another example, Marriott Rewards, a hotel chain, a big one. We are not working with them, okay? Uh, at some point, I stayed with them. I started the chat in Messenger. So it had a record, like a, a, a memory of me. And when they, actually it was last week or the week before, they started a marketing campaign. They spam everyone, whoever has chat with them, so that they say, hey, they know my name, of course, in Messenger. They said, hey, Elliot, you know, if you register now, uh, if you're not registered and then you do it, then you get a 3,000 points, bonus points. My first reaction was that, hey, what, 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 what do I do with the points? What's the point with the points? And they just came back to me with this answer. <laughs> So, no, no, these are just uh, common kind of uh, uh, issues in making a chatbot these days. What kind of problems, again, going back to UX, what kind of problems this tool, this channel you want to use to solve? Who are the audiences? If you just go out and do it just because everybody else does, then this is the result. People laugh at you, like uh, in a presentation like this. Another thing we notice uh, when we are working on this chatbot project uh, is that um, different kind of behaviors, different uh, uh, ways how people in different countries would use a messenger or chat services. In China, in Taiwan, this is a chat screen. <laughs> I hate it. I have a lot of Hong Kong friends and then, uh, uh, more of my relatives. They do the same thing. They, I, I, don't know, I don't know how much you do it. They, they always talk like this in the chat. And then they listen, and they talk, and they listen. I mean, in Europe, we don't do things like this. So when we develop a chatbot actually for the Chinese and also uh, for the Taiwan market, this is exactly something we need to take into account. How are we going to do this? <laughs> really? Uh, I just was... Uh, the other day, trying to uh, scout around and then try to learn about a chatbot more, and then um, I, a colleague of mine just told me about this Camp Cup. You know that little cafe in the, at the post office? That uh, they serve you noodles and then uh, food and also uh, breakfast and also coffee? <clears throat> they also have a chatbot. They let you to uh, order and uh, they, they give you uh, they provide delivery, they also let you to reserve a table there. That really, when I saw it, it was a wake up call. I said, well, look at this, you know, even a cafe that sells you $2 per, per noodles, they have a chatbot. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, 20 years ago, remember that when people start talking about, okay, okay, we, we, we need a website, let's do a website. 10 years ago, everybody said, hey, 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 you know, we need an app now, let's do an app. And now, the conversational user interface with some AI is the thing. Well, among many other things, of course. 
we see the wave coming. But again, we want to focus on is that, hey, what is the experience of the user? What are the problems? Who are the users? What is the worthwhile solving? And also what are the concepts and ideas that are validated by the testers, by the users, so that we only then we develop. Uh, one last case I want to show you is that uh, we, we, we noticed a problem uh, quite some time ago at DMI in our office that uh, I said a couple of times we have over 100 people here at the office in Phnom Penh. Uh, we have about uh, 20 people, 20 experts coming from different countries. And uh, I simply don't remember everybody's names. I, I, I just don't get the no matter how hard I try and how long it would take, you know, matching faces with the name with so many people, it's my problem. And also the same problem for many colleagues that I noticed. And it's embarrassing. I've been working here for almost two years now and some of the colleagues I have, you know, I still don't remember the names, even though we sit together. <laughs> so, then I, I said one day to my team, uh, uh, when we had some slack time, I said, you know, guys, we, 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 we need to solve this problem. This is, this is not working, man. I said, why don't we have a game? The main problem is that how to help us, all of us, to remember people's names better, even though you don't work with them on a day-to-day -day basis. So why don't we play a game? I, I remember, I'm a gamer, right? So a simple thing, you know, a competition, there's a picture there, and this is the very first, you know, prototypes, you know, we, we did it with, uh, within a couple of days, that uh, in the database we can easily do it with the HR, that, you know, all the names of the people, all the positions and the pictures, and then we just shoot it into the system, and then a picture of this, uh, who is this guy, you choose. You got it right, you move to another, you got it wrong, and you move to another also, but at the end, uh, show you the points, and then we have ranking. and then we tested somehow, people love it, and then we elaborated the, 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 the user interface better, and then a different kind of uh, also a data, accuracy, points, all-time record or weekly uh, uh, record, and somehow this is something that, that we, we try to also develop further to solve one user problem, right? Test, quick all of the purpose to try to understand the user's problem, user's needs better. We can use a design process like this or just think of it this way. So that will enable us to make very good and kick-ass surface to make a lot of money. That is UX as we practice and as we understand it. Okay, now time for questions and then uh, asking why and what. Like a designer. Yep, yes. So, um, I had a look at the audience here, and it seems like the majority are designers in some way, shape, or form. And my question would be what advice do you have to everyone here who basically gets told, Hi, I want this website? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I, I, we face that problem a lot of times also. Uh, there's a lot of frustration, definitely. We, we, we have been wondering about that, how to do it. Uh, along the way, how, how, how we try to solve that problem is that uh, you just need to have solid proof to begin with for whatever that you think that is a better solution that, no, no, we, let's not use, make an app. We can just make a mobile site, right? You need to prove it. A lot of times, especially decision maker, seeing is believing. Show numbers also. 
it doesn't really help that much, you know, how much uh, marketing talk and then a really fancy presentation, whatever you show it to them, they don't even look at it. They don't have to spend time. Spend some time really off track, even outside office hours. If you really believe in so much, go there, take an extra mile and get some proof. Talk to the users. Hey, you easily, let's say uh, uh, for some projects we have, we just simply even without any, let's say, agreement with the client, we go to EMO, talk to people randomly with a set of questions. If you talk to 100 random people and you find some pattern in it, there is some leverage, there is some, some argument. Show it to the decision maker. Because I, I, there's no way to, to, to fight that way that, hey, hey, you know, I, I, I believe really much, you know, uh, big boss, you know, we shouldn't have uh, apps. It, it doesn't work that way. I hope you answer your question. Yes? Hi, I'm My question is totally about the topic, but it's relevant. Okay, okay, wow, wow. <laughs> let, let, let's hear about it. Yeah. Uh, because you are the designer, right? Yes. If somebody gives you a product that's horribly designed, it's a very bad design, but the purpose behind the product is good, would you spend time to give the owner of the product some comfort? Yeah, why not? I, I, I don't see any, any, any harm in that. If I believe in that, if I believe in their product. Okay, great. But also, even though I don't believe in it, I can actually just say, you know, hey guys, you know, this, is, uh, this, uh, this problem is not worthwhile solving. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so you have some product? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes? The, uh, uh, the process, what I have shown you here in different ways or different formats, they can be as long as two months. It can be also one week. Design sprint, what we can do with design sprint, Monday we work out the, the understand the current status, what is the problems. Tuesday, ideas, concept, and then uh, Wednesday you develop. Thursday, you test. Friday, you go to, you know, recap and combine and learn again. And Monday, you can start again on another sprint. So in the example of the five days you mentioned, how many people do you need for that? I mean, assuming you need to So if you advise a company... I mean, uh, it depends really, uh, but ideally, you need a designer, I suppose. <laughs> and then a certain person who has a technical background, a developer maybe, a solution architect or uh, preferably also someone from the business side and then adding one extra, you know, random I think four, you have uh, quite a good team to begin with already The problem is not a lot of times about how many people I mean, of course, if you, if you go over, let's say, you know, uh, age to 10 then the group is really too, too big to, to act really agile The problem a lot of times I see is that the commitment that can you really have all these four or five people in this week totally, 110% focusing on this? And they really keep going because if one of the people in the team drags behind, then you also, you know, drag everybody else behind. So the commitment is, is more important for me. Yes? Uh, I would like to ask how is it for you to explain Customer, the time you need to spend on the user experience. Right? <coughs> Do they come to you before they fail or after they fail with their previous design and you need to review the things? No, they are both cases. Some of our clients really they come around and say, help, 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 we, we have a problem here. <laughs> Fix it. The others is more like, oh, we have a plan and what you can do for us, and then okay, we, we give you a proposal. Uh, <clears throat> how we can convince, I, I think. Uh, by experience, a lot of times really be honest and really lay out the plan and also be clear about the deliverables. Our, our experience is that uh, if the deliverable is too 
is too vague, it's too theoretical, they are not actionable, then, then it doesn't work that well. No. It, they always, I mean, we are still talking about running a business, right? Clients. So a lot of times what we talk about in the design team is that uh, in the designers, especially when we're working with the user experience, and when I show you so many slides about money, it's about how we can actually learn to do much better to translate the design language into a business language when we talk to the client. So that they don't need to do the translation work, we do it for them. So once we can talk business, talk money, then we have a much better chance to, to, to really get the case and get it forward. Yes? You first. How do you think the real estate has to ask for feedback from or from some people to really get it from the understanding of the situation? Yeah, it, 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 it depends on uh, uh, <coughs> what you are trying to test. I mean, if you are really the, the more abstract that, that uh, an, a problem or issue you want to figure out, the, the more ideas, the more uh, data you need to get. But if you talk about, let's say, a certain kind of design, a user interface, or uh, some prototype, our experience and also what we, we, we learn from the, the design industry is that uh, between five to six testers, that you already get a quite a good idea of what are the main problems. Let's say six, you can possibly get almost 80% of all the problems that they will point you out. And the more testers you get, let's say 10 or even further, then the, the, the return on investment is, is diminished. That is the experience. But if you're a safe side, let's say get 10. There are also some other practical issues you, you need to take into account. For example, if you plan to have a, a tester, one project we did was that we, we, we had to have um, remote testing. Testers in the US, testing in, in the UK, and we were testing here <laughs> in Cambodia. So we need to make that remote connections. So the original plan was that uh, uh, to have what, like uh, 10 testers? But then some of them drop out because of some uh, logistic issues or they just simply didn't want to show up or they didn't want to get the money. So that gave us the lesson that we should plan ahead for this kind of margin of error so that you don't waste time. Uh, you got a question there, right? Yeah. The design thinking, I said, what I tried to explain here was more like a, a mentality, a thinking that uh, how you should look at things, so that it enable you to do the user experience design or user centric design smoother or better because in, in you you need to have a certain ability in do the design thinking yes because in the design thinking most of the time you, you want to ask what if you should be a uh, family or, or a fam uh, 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 comfortable with ambiguities you want all the time to have improvement how I can get this better and better and better if you, a part of the enabler and uh, it's the ability that you should have because if you don't have the design thinking that uh, what if you always think that okay this idea I have is the best full stop then it doesn't go really well with uh, your user experience design discipline No, we, we, we don't, uh, it's not always. There's no, set kind of, there's no set menu for every single project that we will have to go through this and this and this other activities. So some of, it, I mean, what, what all the methodologies and activities, what I show you here, they're just examples. It should be always like a case by case that you look at the actual problem, look at the actual case and requirements, and then you drag and drop what kind of uh, tools you need if there's enough data coming from the client side or existing database, 
why don't we just take advantage of it and use it first instead of spending time to go to do research? Ah, ah, now, now you're talking about a different, different problem <laughs> because it's again like a user experience design you know, if there's not a problem from the client side that they don't need a user research if you forcibly, you want to sell that to them it doesn't match right? there's no problem so what is their solution to solve? But, but is there is there benefit, is there real purpose for that user research? If there's a need that we, we see, yeah, your, your, or your team sees there's a need, but not just because, oh, because we want to sell user research, that's why we want to force it. Yeah, the money part is that we want to create services that people love to use so that they are willingly to give us more money if there's a problem to solve. Prioritization. This. This is a, a method that is called Kano model. You can actually Google around and know much better in details. But what is on this chart is that uh, this is like the point of delight. This is more like a, like a, you know, standard features, and this part is just boring. Must have. In all the in all the services, in all the apps, all the functionalities and features, they more or less follow the same pattern. Some features that came as a real good delight, people said, "Wow, it's cool." In time, after few months after half a year, they all drop down to this part. It becomes standard. And after some time, it becomes boring. Yeah, th this one I think uh, is a lot more about uh, the actual business, uh, uh, the surface development. That which one of these features, considering the effort needed in development, how many developers we need, or how much business value we will bring co uh, compared to the effort, then we make the prioritization. Yeah, they, they are different. This is, the, this is the effort. How much time is needed? This is the value for the users of business. So the least effort, higher uh, uh, value, of course, that we want to do it first, right? So that, that's what all these different quadrants are about. Okay, yes? Uh, philosophy is one thing, reality is another. Philosophy is that uh, it's doing by, no, learning by doing, definitely. You can go to schools, but also there's a reality. Uh, but if you talk about the particular situation here in, in, in Cambodia, what I learned uh, in this past two years is that 
there are not that much uh, design skill sets here in the country or in, 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 the, in, the, in Phnom Penh uh, <coughs> because uh, there are not that many schools as uh, you mentioned there's only there's one school right that is offering certain classes for design thinking or maybe even UX design <coughs> yeah so in this country if there's only one school offering some classes for that then it gives you an idea that you know that, that what is the, the level here so also what I see myself my experience is just that uh, the people uh, in my team and also other designers that I know they have got to the level by doing and working in projects in agencies and learning there and the other part is uh, the expats they came from other countries with uh, proper trainings so when we got the local staff we train them up in actual projects No, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was based on the data that we get. Like talking with the stakeholders, talking to the users, observing how people actually use, and really surveys, asking people that we synthesize the data and we find out there's a pattern. And then we frame that core problem, which is really much about trust. That is when, when, when we come to the, the concept phase that when, once we know that, for example, the core problem is trust. So we have a workshop together with the stakeholders, potentially users also, that we try to have this methodology, for example, how might we solve this problem of trust? And we have people from dis different disciplines come up with ideas, and then we try to make an evaluation which ideas is more viable, and then we make some prototypes and test it with actual users. Yes. <clears throat> I would say it, it works in practically any industry if you can apply it. Because the idea is still all the time test, validate, improve. And again you test and validate improve. Sorry? Uh, the problem, is, uh, the, the, no, the key here is that actually it's not, you, you, you're not afraid of failure. There are many, many times that certain ideas and I, a concept, you go to test and people say that, nah, I, I don't like it. Or this is stupid. That in a way, I think you can categorize as a failure. But exactly, we want to identify, we want to collect as many of these failures as possible so that they don't get to be developed and increase the correction cost at the end when a surface or, or, or project is live, we want to reduce the cost and reduce the risk. So it's good to have the failures in the design phase. Yes? To add to that, um, this can lead to failures. Yet yeah, always. I from experience because the thing that you have to keep in mind is you are working within certain limitations. The thing that, that you really should remember is your client or your boss or whoever wants something out by Christmas. And what you find through all of this will take until April to actually produce your design process might not fail because you actually found the optional solutions, but your actual overall project fails because they are just gonna drop it and say we can't do that. Mm -hmm, yes. And that's actually this this leads to my next question that I want to actually wanted to ask is that when do you know when you're done? Because you can continue refining and finding optimal solutions. You, uh, in a way, you never know, especially if you follow the design thinking that, you know, there's no end, there's always improvement. So one skill for designers is that learn to put a stop, follow the process. There's a reason why people follow processes. 
so that you can actually do things systematically. And when you do that, you can actually identify the, 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 the problems, the errors, or the solutions easier. And so let's say it's about constraint. Also what you said, constraints actually are good for designers. So you work within certain parameters, a box that you don't have a blue sky and do whatever you want. And when you have that, you don't do anything. But when you are designing, solving a particular problem where we confine with the constraints, there is actually a lot of times when you get to work on magic. But that takes time also. There's a, uh, a lot of things have to fall in place to, to, to make that happen. Experience, skills and the right clients potentially. Uh, a lot of times you don't get to do really fantastic and crazy project. But every now and then they come. Get all of great examples, but uh, I really like the one with the trust. So how long did it take you to figure out and trust? Problem. I mean, was it just like going to two people and saying, hey, I would never use this application because I don't trust it? Or was it like more complex issues? Let me get some help here. Quantin, you can answer the question, how long did you come up with that uh, core problem with trust in Sendify? Yeah, how long did it take you and us to go arrive at this core problem that the main problem is trust? Three weeks. So that's a more complex problem. <laughs> yes, but that, that project, I remember what we did was that we really had the stakeholder interviews. We were talking with, uh, uh, we had uh, benchmarking. We have also a customer, uh, yeah. So we, again, this, uh, there was no particular magic or, or special thing. We just take whatever that, uh, uh, input we could get that we saw that was relevant and then we sat down with the client and just talk and discuss and try to make some reasonable decision or get some insight out of it. And it looks you did a great job at the end because you know, it improved the application. So great. So far so good. <laughs> you got a question? Yes, yeah, so uh, we're looking at the schedule. Most likely, that uh, earliest we can have is in April. So. March, April. That's the time we're looking at. Uh, you sign up when we uh, announce the <laughs> when we announce the the, the, the events in Meetup, right? Uh, so that uh, we will be first come first serve. That I think it will have a bit more restriction on the number of people who can participate, because uh, if we have one a workshop, hands-on workshop with this much people, that is not practical. So we will know more in details. But the idea of that workshop is that uh, we will we will go through in a rather quick uh, time frame the design process. Working on particular problem, try and test some of these methodologies, and at the end, you got some validation. Yes? That, that is, uh, that I don't have a particular answer for that. There's no, no any, because a lot of this project also, we only did the design part. We didn't do any development for them. So that there, there, there's not there always this uh, golden ratio, how much. Uh, it really depends a lot of times. Sometimes it can be 20, 80, sometimes it can be 40, 60. But as I said, uh, many of this project, we only did the design, it was 100%. Yeah, but let's say you do the project. It, it, it's really hard to say because I mean it depends on what problem we identified and what solution we arrive at at the end is validated. So once we get a solution validated, uh, how many features that we think 
that is you know, needed with all the stakeholders, not just designers. And on top of it, you also have uh, the road mapping, the technical feasibilities on the client side or whoever that would develop this, how much resource they have. So that means that, you know, that, that later part, it only is uh, more definite after the scoping. That, that, I, I, hang on, here. You get a concept, you validate, and here there's a step called scoping. You need to especially do the technical scoping. You break all the features down into user stories. As a user, I want to do this and this and this, and then you have some estimation, how long time will it take whatever developer to actually make that happen. This part, we cannot tell until we figure out this part. So that's what I said, sometimes it can be at the end, 2080, it can be 4060. Someone else had a question. Yes. Yeah, my question was very similar to him. Uh, actually, um, sometimes I have to run the project with like a Java Prince Prize, which is the price has been set and the scope also has been set. And it's, it's a, it was agreed before uh, we have the concept and understanding, like, you know, like a challenge. Yes, people, yes. But, but they said, like, the price is not like There is no uh, a fixed answer for that. I think a lot of times uh, that, that actually highlights the, the, the issues uh, in uh, many companies and organizations that how well the sales will work together with the designers and try to figure out so that they won't sell something that is not sustainable or business viable down the road. If you sell some fixed scope projects and yet you want to reach out and along the way you find something better, then there's no way you can go back to correct the contract. You should attack the problem from the source. And now if you get yourself into that trouble, I, I, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> But get, get the salespeople really uh, on board very fast about the, the benefit of the design, UX design. So that the sooner they can get it, the more they can grok the idea, they can understand, then the better they can help you to sell more what you believe or we believe. Then you can solve all the problems down the road. I'm sorry? Okay. First of all, uh, uh, there, <laughs> there's some general practice uh, what we do in the design, at least in our team, is that uh, we do not particularly want to offer the clients options. We are paid as a design professionals, we should know the best, we offer them that you know this is the best thing. If you offer option one and option two and option three, there's always this, uh, uh, <laughs> what, what do you call the, the, the the laws or uh, whatever that, that your client most likely will always choose the worst option that you don't like. So don't get yourself into that position. So we uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> So don't do that, but if you have done it, then you need to find a way somehow to deal with it. That don't start again like the sales problem. Don't start uh, <laughs> creating problems that you don't want to solve down the road. And at the end, anyway, you are the professional that they pay for, so do the professional job and deliver the best solution for them. Okay? I think that's all the time that we have for the... Hey, thank you.
case you haven't registered for the event and you want to get follow-ups on both the materials that were shared today, the slides, as well as the videos and pictures, do make sure you're registered. Uh, there will be a front, a front desk with some papers. If you haven't registered, just leave your email there. Uh, you will be part of the Startup Jungle. Second thing is that there will be hands-on workshop following sometime in March, April. Again, if you're part of the mailing list, you will get an announcement on that and you can register. And there will be obviously other topics. If you have specific opinions on what topics we should cover, let us know and we'll try to find the best speakers for you. Yeah? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, no problem.